So I had a dream the other day that um, we were hired for some reason to do a benefit, like a charity benefit for special needs kids. Okay. And then I accidentally made a joke in which I used the word retard. Oh, you shouldn't do that. We're not going to get no. invited back to that benefit ever again. And like dream benefits are really hard to get into because they don't exist. Right, yeah. But I, the more shocking part wasn't that I was extremely offensive. Even though I hate that using that word, the more shocking part was that someone thought, you know those two assholes on the internet? My subconscious thought, those two assholes are worthy of doing anything for charity for a good cause. Meanwhile, we're here, like, talking about dicks. Yeah, why would they call us? If anything, that's on them. The people who made the charity decision to hire us, frankly, they should have seen this coming. Bad call, fake imaginary Jake's head planners. everyone i'm hugo and i am jake and this is the bible reloaded again yes we're back billionth time yes we're back and today we're skipping over a lot of stuff and we're gonna get through a whole chapter so aren't you guys lucky we're gonna get through three books of the bible today yeah pretty magical and by get through i mean here's what happened in first and second chronicles so last time as you know we finished second kings and that was a lot of fun and uh israel was actually basically deposed. Everyone in the area was basically spread out because they were conquered and Jerusalem as an entity ceased to exist. So, mm-hmm. what happened in First and Second Chronicles is actually just basically a recap and reiteration of the things that had happened in First and Second Kings and some of the stuff before it. For instance, they re-go over some David stuff, they talk about some of his other conquests, uh, they also do some Saul stuff, and they definitely, in Second Chronicles, they talk a lot about Solomon and his wisdom. We're not going to go over it again because it's a lot of reiteration and a lot of it is lists. For instance, when they're talking about David's conquering instead of uh, dwelling on like story and why he's doing it, in Chronicles they tend to look at more numbers-wise. That's usually sort of the record keeping area so it's the the first and second kings those are the stories and then chronicles is sort of the appendix if that makes sense it's like and here's the records we kept of those events they're shitty records but you get it it's just basically a historical redundancy thing um because they were trying to keep records after the fact when they get conquered like uh persia is in charge of them and they kind of need to consolidate all of their knowledge and laws in order to kind of operate under that reign. Uh, and interestingly, amongst all that, there are definitely some contradictions. Obviously, we don't have time to go over all of them, but mostly they're in numbers. Uh, so what you can do if you want to check those out for yourself, uh, you can Google biblical contradictions, and I'm sure you can find them, but more specifically, uh, Skeptics Annotated Bible, they do really well with a lot of those number contradictions. So if you went on there and you looked up First and Second Chronicles, chapter by chapter, they will have those and the contradictions Uh, right next to it annotated. So that's really nice. So if you want to check those out on your own, feel free to do so. But today, we're going right back into the story in Ezra, in which Israel comes back together. See, it happened almost immediately. So not really a point to doing it. So Ezra's cool, though, because it kind of gives you an insight into what happens while they're under Persian rule. Yeah. Chapter 1, Cyrus helps the exiles to return. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is very similar to what he did with Egypt, only reverso, because now now God's like, tell you what, you're you're not going to have free will in regards to, in to, to my Jews again, uh, but this time, instead of having some guy do a snake staff and like kill your babies and stuff, you can just let him go right now. It's fine. This is what Cyrus, the king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Interesting that the king of Persia, who is not Jewish, uh, is calling Yahweh the God of heaven, but whatever. Maybe he was in disguise as the Persian God. Maybe he, like, put on, like, a a fake mustache and he was, like, 
No, I'm totally the Persian god. You know, Yahweh, that guy's super cool. You should let the Jews uh, build their own temple. Wink, wink. Also, no one else can see this, but uh, I'm doing a finger mustache as I say this, because I'm all about authenticity. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, and the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. He's so pro-Yahweh at this point, which leads me to believe this is just the Jews saying, why did he not want to be in charge of us anymore? I guess it must have been Yahweh. When really it was probably, wow, this place sucks. We're going to leave now. Not to mention, according to the Old Testament, the Jews of the Old Testament are the whiniest group of desert dwellers to ever crawl out of a hole. <laughs> the hole is a Jewish vagina. It's a vagina. It's Jewy. <laughs> then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests of the Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, were prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors assisted them with the articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts. In addition to all the free will offerings, they make it sound like it was like a nice thing they were doing. No, the king of Persia made them for some reason. He really wanted them out. No, seriously, trust me. Over the long term, we're going to be much better off with all these Jews here said the anti-Semitic king of Persia. <laughs> yeah, it used to be Xerxes, the same guy that conquered, uh, you know, Athens. The Gerard Butler? The guy who, who killed Gerard Butler? The guy who killed Gerard Butler, yeah. Wait, does he kill... I haven't seen 300. Does Gerard Butler... He was in White House Down, I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Is Moreover, the name of that Cyrus movie? White House Down? <laughs> They're it's making either a that sequel. One, it's either that. No, that they're making a sequel to Olympus Has Fallen, which is the other movie. No, it's Olympus Has Fallen. Yeah, no. White House is down with Jamie Foxx and and the other guy that was in 21 Jump Street. And then, and then yeah, this one, Olympus Has Fallen. And now they're doing now London they're doing like, Has Fallen. Yeah. London Has Fallen because the president is going to visit and yep. Gerard Butler is going to save everyone because he's Scottish. No, I think it's the other one. The one with the, the, the Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum's no, in this not. one. No, it's not. No, it's not. I get no. this mixed up. They shouldn't have made those movies. <laughs> he could be cast in it, but it's Gerard Butler's show. Honestly, they might have switched actors between the two films and I wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> Gerard Butler. He's like a weird, semi-chubby, good-looking. He's got like a really round face. He's clearly... Like, sometimes in shape, but he doesn't, like, maintain it. Gerard Butler is hot, but attainable, middle-aged, probably divorced hot. You know what I mean? Like, he's he's the neighbor that you, you're, you're like, this is my bodice ripper, by the way. This is my plot for that. <laughs> you're uh, a, a single mother yeah, uh, with, with a kid, and you move into this new neighborhood trying to start your new life because things were really bad. You just left your abusive husband and you move and in. And then Gerard Butler catches him come over and visit you against your will and he beats him up and then you fall in love. I See, okay, see, you jumped the gun too quickly. What I was going to have, it was going to build up. You were going to have maybe like a door that stuck or something or was off its hinges and Gerard Butler would see you trying to fix it and he'd go... I could maybe help you with that. See, he has a deeper voice in my fantasies because the masculinity is what does it for me. And right. then uh, he fixes things over uh, in the house slowly over time. And then he ravages your body with his with his socket wrench of a dick. It's more like a tusk that he keeps in his pants. That work? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sufficiently moist, so I'm well always done. good to go. Whatever. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his god. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought to Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. This was the inventory. And then, uh, it looks like, uh, this, basically. I hope Jake can find a picture of this. If not, imagine, if you will, it says the name of the thing, and then next to it, it has the numbering. So it says 30 gold dishes, a thousand silver dishes. Wow, there was a premium put on the gold, apparently, because there were, like, exponentially more than there are of, uh, you know. 29 silver pans, but then next to pans, there's a superscript C, and then it says, the meaning of this Hebrew word is uncertain. So, they're not pans. They're silver something. They're like, we have no fucking clue. Anthropologist looked at the word, said, I don't know what this word means. And they went, I don't know. Maybe they're pans. And they went, yep, that's what we're going with. 
They were those silver slotted Kanye glasses. Yeah, that's what it was. 30 gold bowls, 410 matching silver bowls. They're with, matching. So the, the other ones were not matching. The These other bowls were, definitely were matching. Were completely, it was a plethora of designs of bowls. And they, then, didn't have, they didn't have, uh, you know, uh, factories back then. Yeah. Every bowl was different, except for that one. And then a thousand other articles. Apparently they can't Just list other all Other articles? Things. Whatever, you get well, it. We have some wooden forks, and uh, we have, uh, there's a saddle, and we have one dildo. But it's the community dildo, so make sure you put it back in the fountain when you're done. In all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and of silver. Shesh Bazaar brought all of these things with the exiles when they came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. But here's the that's, thing. If you actually add up, the, if you add up the numbers uh, yeah, that they put add forth... Up. You just look at it. Yeah, it's, it's only... like, oh, those 2,000, and then now there's not even 3,000. Yeah, it's 2,499, but they say it's 5,400. We've talked about before how it seems like in the Bible they definitely inflate the numbers over time to make it more impressive. For instance, there's actually a good... Um, Good example of this. The Dead Sea Scrolls. If you don't know what the Dead Sea Scrolls are, it's a very, very old manuscript. It's one of, if not the oldest, versions of some of these Old Testament scriptures that we have. And in them, we have the David and Goliath story. In that story, I believe Goliath's only 6'9", in that version. Mm-hmm. But in the most recent versions that we have now in the Bible, he's like seven, like 9 foot something. So, over time, the story, as it was told, he got taller and taller and taller until now he's really big. Now, for reference, what happened was people used to be shorter, so even then, 6'9 would have been huge. Uh, so he's still a giant within the context of the story. But it's interesting that over time, in order to compensate for the fact that people got larger uh, and the story needed to be more impressive, they continually made him taller. So something similar probably happened here, where they inflated the numbers, but then they forgot t- to fix the, the smaller numbers to make it match. I don't know. You'd think someone in editing would have been like, huh, what's up with that? Eh. Or at least, well, why even count them if it's not going to be accurate? I I'm assuming count- the- I think they were counting on the fact that nobody who lives in the desert knows how to count accurately. <laughs> Maybe. Anyway. So then in chapter 2, the list of exiles who returned, all that happens is it's just a list of the different families uh, and the way they sort it is by the head of household, which is, of course, the man, uh, and then how many uh, kids they brought with them, basically. Uh, And it's pretty boring, but interestingly, in Nehemiah chapter 7, which is actually the next book of the Bible, it has the same list, but it has different numbers. I'm not going to go over all of them because it's just the same thing, just different numbers, but interestingly... Uh, another contradiction. This part of the Bible, full of contradictions, especially with numbers. They just can't keep them straight. But then we move on to chapter 3, Rebuilding the Altar, which is, surprisingly, about rebuilding the altar. When the seventh month came and all the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Jozadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shetiel, and his associates began to build the altar of God in Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it, in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses and the man of God. Despite the fear of the people around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord. Why were they worried about burning offerings? That's what they've done, like, forever. Maybe they thought it wasn't cool anymore because they started to become socially progressive under Persian rule. <laughs> Maybe. I'm also, why did it take seven months? Wasn't the whole point of them coming back together so they could be a nation and worship their god together? But they well, got there and maybe they were like, uh, we'll build the altar tomorrow. And to, now we got to unpack the boxes because we just moved. They like to worship very tantrically. <laughs> They're the sting orgasms of religion. Yes. Then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the festival of the tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. <laughs> they and did it correctly! Good <laughs> job! We have to write it down, they, did, they didn't fuck it up this time! Sweet! After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as free will offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to bur- offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. <laughs> so there's just like dead shit everywhere and the contractors over there like guys the fuck i have to build this you can't just put shit down in the foundation this is gonna turn into an episode of bones i've never seen bones i don't know i don't know what to never make seen of that. bones no it's all right the uh angel from buffy is in it and he's not a vampire and then and then uh uh you know the girl in um elf that sings the song in the shower yes 
Uh, Zoe Deschanel. Oh, her, Zoe uh, Deschanel. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Her her less talented sister is the main character. Oh, yeah. My hopes up for some Deschanel. Well, no. there's still a Deschanel. She's just the bad one. She's the one you don't want. Is she like almost annoyingly quirky? No, Zoe, like she seems like the I, type of girl who'd play a ukulele. She probably has like an ancient ukulele, but doesn't play it. She seems like a type that. That like would take the hipster things and just keep them around, but not actually use them. Zoe De Chanel would like wear flats and tights with a polka dot dress and play the uke all day, like right after getting like a soy latte. That's... But she's but she is very talented. Zoe De Chanel to me is hot in almost an annoying way. Yeah, I know. Like yeah, it's like, like a weird I'll... like. Yeah, I would. I would. I wouldn't for long, but I would. That'd be that would be a great week and a half before you got super annoyed and kicked her out without cab fare. So then the next part is rebuilding the temple. We're not going to go over it because it's very similar to rebuilding the altar. They just decide to rebuild the temple. But then we have chapter four, opposition to rebuilding, because you can't do anything without a lot of red tape. There's always going to be someone opposed to it, I guess. Even when it involves doing the one thing you were sent there to do. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the Ershadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. You know, I, I don't blame them for trying to come and sabotage, because when the Israelites have power and a temple and a king of their own, they tend to get a little murdery. Um, yeah, very murdery. Especially if if God's actually active, like he'll open up the earth and swallow people, or or like plague them, or fire tornado on a good day. Fire tornado is real good. Or he'll like melt things just for touching a box. It's awesome. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, "You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We are alone, and will build it for our Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us." Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So they're I, just strong-arming the citizens. They're basically the mob. Basically. But, it kinda, but specifically a temple mob. It both disappoints me and gives me hope that, like, so long ago, people were still doing shitty things. Like, regardless yeah. of whether or not this is historically accurate as far as the strong arming goes, like, they sure. know that's a thing, so that must have been a thing that was rampant enough that the corruption was still a thing. <laughs> Makes me feel a little good. Like, sure, is Donald Trump a dick? Sure, but maybe there was, like, a Persian Donald Trump. Maybe Xerxes had a bad hairpiece. We don't know. So then we skip some stuff. We're skipping, like, five, six, seven, and 8, because all that happens is it talks about... There's delays in building the temple because some people dissuade the king of Persia from allowing them to do it because they remind him, oh yeah, the Jews last time they had power, they did a lot of bad shit. And uh, <laughs> they even mention, you know, when they have rulers and kings and you try and rule over them, it doesn't go very mm. well. So he goes, yeah, you're probably like, right, we'll stall it. Then there becomes a new king of Persia. He sort of has a thing going on. He has a vision and he basically changes his mind and says, oh no, it's fine. You guys can build it again. So it gets built and everyone comes back and it's basically Israel again. Definitely downsized, but it does exist. And now we get to Ezra's prayer about intermarriage. I don't think we're going to go through the whole thing here, but uh, if you, this section is uh, interesting in the sense that it's actually written from a first-person perspective. You don't get that a lot, uh, at least uh, not at this part of the Bible, so it's kind of neat. After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from their neighboring peoples with their detestable practices like those of the Canaanites, <laughs> Hittites, Pezzarites, Jezebites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites. They have All well known to do butt stuff. Yeah. Which is detestable in the eyes of the Jews. That would make that would make the Jews the only people who don't do butt stuff. That would make them the prudes. They're not even <laughs> it's not that the other people are sluts. They're just like, okay, you know what? Butthole, just a hole. You want to put stuff in my hole? Go for it. I respect right. you, Amorites. I respect your gaping buttholes. Right. I mean, if a Canaanite and a Hittite want to get down and do do the dirty inside of a b-hole, maybe blow an O-ring every once in a while, that's totally fine. I have no issues with uh, Canaanite on Hittite rim jobs. You know, there's a reason there's not many Canaanites anymore. They kept blowing their loads in each other's intestines instead of in their vaginas, and they didn't make any more. 
<laughs> the thought the intestines yep. there is what yeah okay yep, yep, yep. they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them the holy race mingled with the peoples around them mm, who's that sound like that sounds real hitlery is that hitlery is that where he got it from was ezra yeah man man hitler got a lot of ideas from the jews hitler also him. not into butt stuff Hitler was into butt stuff. Hitler was into poop stuff. Hitler was into Hitler poop was stuff, into... but he was not into butt stuff. There's a big difference. He was into cousin poop stuff, which is mm. especially, especially sexy. He, yeah, but he wasn't going in a butt. He's happy with the stuff that comes out of a butt, though. I almost respect that more than people who like to put things in butts. Because at least they're it being... Takes a, it takes a stronger will. It does. That's it's, for sure. It's being honest about what a butt is. People are like, ooh, butt holes. <laughs> no, do you know what that does? Poop comes out of it. At least, at least people who like to smear poop on themselves go, you know what? I'm being honest. This is what it's you know, for. I, I'll take. I used to look down on people that were into shit, like as far as a sexual thing. But any man that can maintain a rock hard erection while while they stare down the barrel of someone's asshole as it evacuates itself of its waste, gotta respect that. Gotta respect the perseverance that it takes. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone well, don't who don't do that. That's pain. Why would you do that? He's just super pissed off. Ah, fuck this him. beard rip. Yeah, bummer. But then the rest, he just has a big old prayer where he says, "God, like he kind of sucks God's dick a little bit, as they do for every once in a while." And he's like, "God, please forgive us. We're sorry. We'll fix it. You're the best. You're the best, God. I'm Ezra." So now we get on to. The last thing we're going to cover in this episode, and actually the end of Ezra, and that is the people's confession of sin. This is pretty awesome. We're so fucking efficient. You are welcome. We're like the bullet train of Bible studies. While Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children gathered around him. They well, too- Yeah, because he's a fucking- he's pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this old man crying in the middle of the street. Let's laugh at him because it's before people understood that people's lives had value. They too wept bitterly. <laughs> it spread. They're like, I'm also in melancholy. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Alam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us, but in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now, let us make a covenant before the Lord our God to send away all these women and children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commandments of our God. All these women and children, you mean their families? Yeah. So, in accordance <laughs> with the will of the Lord, they're going to split up all of these families because they were from other tribes. Cool beans, God. Cool beans. Let it be done according to the law. Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you, so take courage and do it. Take courage and do it. It takes a lot of courage to rip apart children from their parents. Yeah, and especially since women had, had, like, no agency, really, and often no income outside of, the, like, their husbands because they were often homemakers. Like, basically, you just you just shoved several thousand women and children into poverty. Yeah. Just because they were a different shade of brown. Especially because in these cultures, it would have been, uh, if you were already married and already had a kid, you'd be considered less valuable as a mate. So it's going to be hard to find right. someone else. And it's not like you can just go get a job. It's, you know, there aren't jobs for women. You can't. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> They're not allowing this. So a lot of these people probably starved and died if this happened at all. Again, I don't know. And then, of course, all the husbands would definitely have seller's remorse after the fact, because no more butt stuff. <laughs> so Ezra rose up and put the leading priests and the Levites and all Israel under oath to do what had been suggested. And they took the oath, all of them. I like that it glosses over any people who may have disagreed. Clearly, someone must have been like, uh, excuse me, I love my family. Like, even if that wasn't the standard at the time, like, hey... I don't mind these pieces of shit kids. They're desert kids. I get it. They're brown. And even though I'm brown, I also don't like brown people. But for real, though, can I, like, not ruin my whole life, guys? And then they killed him and never wrote about him. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the room of Jehonan, the son of Elihib. While he was there, he ate no food and drank no water because he continued to mourn over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. That's not unfaithfulness. Nope. That's just getting some getting some foreign V. Also, what were they supposed to do? They were all spread out. They were no longer in Jerusalem. It's not like they were in big Jewish populations. They were apparently exiled and, like, mingled with the communities they were in. 
So what were but they supposed also, to do? This practice, this practice doesn't even make sense as far as how you would want to make sure that your religion spread or how your community... Because the best way to do this sort of thing, and Christianity changed the game on this. Like, like there are French papers from, from uh, like, the very early pre-colonial times... Um, or I guess contemporary to the colonial times, but they weren't really like official colonies. They were just kind of like forts. But uh, Antoine de Lemo, Cadillac, the founder of Detroit, has letters written to his clergy about like, we need more Frenchmen over here because we need to convert the population via marriage and fucking. That's like the opposite of how to spread religion. I'll give the Jews this. They don't try and spread their religion, generally speaking. Usually they're just like, no, it's our thing. Stay yep. out of it. <laughs> <laughs> like all right cool <laughs> like, how do you even get a population if you're not if you're not like allowing people into the fold though like pretty much you're gonna have a bunch of weird jewy hills have eyes kids that like watch a fiery bush yeah they're called hasids anyway a proclamation was then issued throughout judah and jerusalem for all the exiles to assemble in jerusalem anyone who failed to appear within three days would forfeit all his property in accordance with the decision of all the officials and elders and would himself be expelled from the assembly of the exiles it's not like they have fucking minivans what if you're three and a half days journey out no you just like by the time you got the letter you would have already forfeited your property this is excellent game theory testing if no i want to see what would have happened if no one showed up they're like are we really going to take everyone's property i don't even know what to do with this <laughs> Just like six guys have all the property now, and they're like, "Do we do we do a feudal system now? Am I am I a lord? <laughs> yeah. Do I get to have horses? Yeah. You're like, a... do we have armor? But we're in the desert, so we don't really have like. Well, we could just make like tree branch armor. It'll be great. So you're gonna wear wood? Yes. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Feudal system doesn't really work well in the desert because it's pretty much just like, hey, have some sand. Within the three days, all the men of Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem, and on the twentieth day of the ninth month, all the people were sitting in the square before the house of God, greatly distressed by the occasion and because of the rain. I like that we got a nice... <laughs> they were like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have been unfaithful. You have married foreign women and adding to Israel's guilt. Now honor the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. This is the most xenophobic thing I've ever read. And I've read parts of Mein Kampf. <laughs> the whole assembly responded with a loud voice. You are right. We must do as you say. A lot of, lot of men looking for a reason for a divorce in this time, <laughs> apparently. No, none of them were newlyweds and like in that blissful stage. No. All of them had already popped the seal. They knew what they were getting. They're done. But there are many people here, and it is a rainy season, so we cannot stand outside. Besides, this matter cannot be taken care of in a day or two, because we have sinned greatly in this thing. Let our officials act for the whole assembly. Then let everyone in our towns who have married a foreign woman come out at a set time, along with the elders and judge of each woman, until the fierce anger of our God in this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan and Asael and Jehazah, son of Tikva, supported by Methuselah, and Shabbatai, the Levite, opposed this. So those are the people who opposed it. Out of all the thousands of people, those are like the four. Those are the ones that were like, I'm totally into butt stuff. Like, I'm not undoing this. So this is great. They're only into butt stuff. They cannot stand vaginas. That's probably because they were gay. It's probably because they were super yeasty. That's why there was... They wouldn't allow any leavened bread okay. because the yeast had a chance of getting in the vagina. It if your vag is that yeasty, there's it's going to like travel down to the butthole every once in a while, and you're going to have a yeasty, poopy butthole. I'm real proud of our show. Have I ever told you that? <laughs> yeah, I'm real. This is what we do. So the exiles did as was proposed. Ezra the priest selected men who were family heads, one from each family's division, and all of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to investigate the cases. And they, the first day of the month, they finished dealing with all the men who had married foreign women. On the rest of the page, all that is is those guilty of intermarriage, and it just lists the people who were found guilty of intermarrying, uh, I guess so they could be shamed for all eternity. And that's the end of Ezra. So next time we're going to get into Nehemiah, uh, assuming there is some good stuff. Usually there's at least one or two interesting things, and we'll get to that. And then after that, we have Esther, which is real good, involves some decapitations, uh, and a woman who convinces uh, her husband of some stuff because she has a vagina. Also, there's impalements. Yeah. Love them. So thanks, everyone. You can always check us out on Twitter at Bible Reloaded. You can always follow Hugo at Hugo Reloaded, and you could always 
press that big, shiny, glowing, throbbing subscribe button. Titillate us a little bit. Every time you do, I can feel it in my penis. You can always uh, help us out by supporting our Patreon campaign. We do a once a month patron only hangout. That's lots of fun. We talk to you guys, answer your questions, read a comic book together. Uh, it's really a good time. So if you're a patron of any sort, uh, keep an eye out for when we announce the dates of that. Usually we'll always message you on Patreon uh, and in a Bible study or another thing right before that. We'll always say when it's going to be. So Sure thing, bro chachos. So thanks everyone. Until next time, I'm Hugo. And I am Jake. And this has been The Bible Reloaded. If this was if this video was on Pornhub, you would obviously have just searched uh, TBR anal. Totally would have came up. Might work in YouTube. You can try it. <laughs>